of interruption. Uh, it's much nicer to see each other's face for, for a change. We are uh, very grateful to have uh, Thomas Grimm from Utrecht, who accepted the invitation on short, invi on short notice. And so he's, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, speaking remotely, and they will talk about asymptotic flux compactifications and the tameness of the string landscape. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, during the talk, either through the chat or uh, here in the room by speaking up. And uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. It's uh, up, up to you now. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the invitation. Well, first of all, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to be the first speaker in an in-person session, even so I'm not uh, in Paris. I'm sorry about this. I have uh, some uh, PhD um, talk in the afternoon, which I have to attend. Uh, but it, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to speak in this seminar, in this, uh, in this hybrid form. And what I'm going to uh, talk about in this talk is, uh, is about flux compactification, so something which is already uh, within string theory studied for many, many years. But uh, I hope you will see I give it a, a new spin. In particular, in the second part of the talk, I will connect uh, our understanding of flux compactifications with some new developments in, in, uh, ge in geometry. It will be based on a, a, a number of papers. Uh, first of all, some paper from last fall, uh, which I wrote, and then uh, in, it will be based on some joint, joint work with uh, uh, Gris Bastien, uh, Damian van der Heisteg, and Eric Blaschin. And then I should also mention that in the last part, I talk about some work with some uh, brilliant uh, mathematicians, Ben Bakker, Christian Schnell, and uh, Jakob Zimmermann. So let me get um, started and let me place uh, first some words of motivation. Well, this, uh, this talk will be dealing with aspects of the, of the Swampland program. Um, as you might know, this is a very active uh, field at the moment. So what is the general idea about, or the general idea behind this Swampland program is, well, it's, it's to investigate general principles that have to be satisfied by effective theories which are compatible with quantum gravity. Yeah. Of course, in some sense, we are doing this, uh, uh, at least people who are working like in string phenomenology, we are doing this for a long, long time, but it kind of erases a more broader perspective on the, on the same questions. And so what is this broader perspective in the cartoon? The cartoon essentially uh, looks like this. There are um, some um, quantum field theories which uh, we believe can be coupled to uh, quantum gravity or if you want to string theory. And then there is a set of uh, quantum field theory which look apparently consistent. So they are consistent with all known low energy constraints like anomaly cancellation and so on. But they turn out to be fundamentally inconsistent when you want to couple them um, to quantum gravity. Well, if you... Uh, if you want to study such general questions, then it's good to, um, to, to focus on at least some part of the effective theory. And this is also what I wanted to, uh, want to do in this talk mostly. Namely, we can now look in more detail at uh, the field spaces on scalar potentials which appear in effective theories. So let's consider an effective theory with a cutoff a lambda and introduce some scalar fields phi, which span a field space, which I call M. Yeah. Then a scalar potential is a map from this field space M to the real line. Which is, and uh, the question which uh, one might ask is, which field spaces M can appear in the landscape or in other words, 
Um, what are the field spaces which are in appearing in consistent effective theories which can be coupled to string theory? The second question you might ask is, uh, which, are the, uh, which are the scalar potentials which are in the landscape, so which can appear in these consistent theories? Well, clearly, these two questions are related. When we lower the cutoff, the notion of an effective theory or the, the, the light fields of the effective theory will change, and we will get a new potential with a new field space. So what do I mean by this? Let's uh, draw a cartoon for this. Let's start with an effective theory which has this field space M, which looks like this, at some cutoff scale. And so I included all the fields of the theory which are light enough to be uh, in the effective theory, and then they have a certain field space. Now, if I lower the cutoff scales, lower this cutoff scale, then uh, it could be that some of the fields uh, will be so heavy that they rather should be integrated out, that they should not be any more part of the effective theory. And it, uh, it can be that the effective theory actually then splits up into multiple effective theories and we have different branches of the theory, right? It could be that one of these fields has a, a, has a potential with, which has multiple minima and therefore I get multiple effective theories depending around, uh, of which, uh, on which minimum I'm choosing to expand the new effective theory and so on. So in this cartoon here, I have shown that a two-dimensional field space gets reduced to a one-dimensional field space. And the next step could be you could lower the cut cutoff even further. And it could be that at the end of the day, everything uh, just becomes uh, discrete. So if I include massless fields only, I have just discrete vacua, or maybe also a one-dimensional, then it's a flat, a flat uh, direction. So, so these are the sort of uh, situations we want to study and we want to ask ourselves, uh, can we find constraints on potentials and field spaces which can be compatible with quantum gravity? Of course, this is a tremendously difficult question and I'm not claiming that I uh, will give you a general definite answer, but you will see, I will try to uh, develop uh, general principles and what, what is the kind of the, the, main, the main concept which will play uh, uh, the important role in the following? Namely, we can ask, well, that seems like a minimal question. How many of these effective theories are compatible with quantum gravity or string theory? So, so depending on the scat cutoff, I could ask how many of these low loci actually exist? Yeah. And in particular, are they finite? Is this just a finite number of such loci? Well, this is long part of the string phenomenology program. And it started uh, already in, in, in the beginning of the 2000s with the work of Douglas and collaborators. And, um, in, and even so, it's very hard to find conclusive answers to this. Uh, the, the importance of these questions has been recognized for quite some time. But uh, sorry, Thomas, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, how do you know you can count them and therefore to say whether they are finite or not? Uh, what was the question? Can you repeat this? Well, the question oh. is, in order to say whether they are finite or not, you should be able to count them and therefore they should be distinct. However, yes. from what we know in string theory, apart from moduli spaces, of course, that we know that they can give a continuum, uh, they could be solutions that interpolate between them. So therefore, what's the notion of counting? You mean the effective theories can be physically not different? Each, each effective theory spans a part of the space of solutions, which are the ones that you can reach them up to some point in your effective field theory, but then they yes. connect to other parts and so on and so on and so on. And that's what we have seen 
uh, consistently, of course, in the 50 years that people study string theory. So what does yes. it mean to count them? Well, I mean, I, I, I think what I, what I tried to explain in the beginning is, uh, is, is precisely this. So you set a cutoff and you want to know uh, how many different effective theories you can formulate below this cut cutoff coming from a higher dimensional theory. Of course, they will, they, if you raise the cutoff, they, they will be eventually connected or they can be connected. Yeah. But I want to, uh, what I want to ask is somehow, I want to ask at least if I get a finiteness statement about the number of possibilities. Okay, uh, it still seems quite vague as a concept to me. And in fact, we've seen that it's vague in the context of ADS-CFT, but maybe we should discuss it at the end. Yeah, you, we can discuss it at the end. I don't think it's, it's particularly vague, but, uh, but I hope it becomes more clear in the following. Okay, so the, the, I should add that there was also much recent activity, for example, People ask uh, about the finiteness of spectra or ranks of gauge groups and so on. So you can, you can just ask, uh, can I get every gauge group from, from string theory or in an effective theory at a certain cutoff scale? Or are there finiteness constraints, right? Is there a, a highest number, a highest rank of a gauge group you can have? So what is the aim in this talk? First of all, I want to indicate a, a new non-trivial finiteness proof. And for doing this, I will have to explain you some, some, some recent advances in, in flux compactifications. And then in the very last part, I will promote finiteness to a, a new uh, universal principle uh, that to constrain effective theories. And I think the idea there is that well, this is something which doesn't require supersymmetry, holomorphicity and all these things. And I will try to introduce briefly a framework which allows you to, to maybe do that explicitly. Okay, so let's get uh, started with the outline. The, the first part is lessons about the complex structure moduli space and flux vacua. And that's where I will draw my intuition from. In fact, this finiteness proof will be about so-called self-dual uh, flux vacua. So what we will see in the first part is that the scalar field spaces and scalar potentials in type to be flux compactifications are remarkably constrained. And uh, these constraints are in some sense just enough to ensure finiteness of vacua. And finally, in the last part, I uh, will be motivated by the fact that this, this very non-trivial proof of this finiteness statement uses some uh, rather exciting mathematical technology. And I will suggest that this new technology could find its way into various different parts of the landscape or studying of string theory effective theories. Okay, then let's, let's get started with flux comp compactifications and some lessons we learned. So, so I, uh, I, I set out like a very general motivation and very, very, hard, uh, very hard question. And of course, I will not be able to pr prove anything in this uh, general, uh, gen generality. What I will do is I will focus on a particular setting, namely on type to be Flux, flux compactifications with background fluxes. And these have been studied over many, many years. They are also, they are very well understood. And I just briefly review some main aspects. So what are background fluxes? Well, they are integral, integral forms. So quantized, uh, they are quantized objects, if you want, in this uh, cohomology group of our compact manifold Y3. And uh, this, is a, in this type to B setting can be a Calabi-Yau manifold or warped Calabi-Yau manifold. They are constrained by a tadpole cancellation condition, but, and this comes from the fact that we actually coupling gravity and we put things on a compact space. 
Then you can study the vacua of the effective theories or even of the 10 dimensional theories. And you see that the vacuum condition for having a, a, a global minimum of the potential of this uh, flux potential is actually the fact is the condition that the Hodge star of this complex flux is I to the complex flux. And this is what I will call self-dual fluxes. There is an I here, but uh, I will use this notation in the following. Why do I call them self-dual fluxes? Well, there exists actually a nice lift to F-theory flux compactification where this Calabiao threefold is replaced by a Calabiao fourfold and things get uh, much, much more elegant in some sense, but the geometry gets more complicated. So there you have a four form flux, so an integral four form, form which is uh, constrained again by a tadpole cancellation condition. And in this case, the vacuum condition is indeed just a self duality condition. So the Hodge star acting on G4 gives back G4 in the vacuum. Yeah. I should say that um, these are very well studied set of vacua. I mentioned this already. They have a partially fixed complex structure moduli. They can have also all complex structure moduli fixed by these vacuum conditions. The back reaction is under control. Higher derivative corrections have been studied and consistently included. And I think it's fair to say that this is the uh, best understood set of, of string vacua where we have an effective theory, where we have a potential and we are confident what we are doing. Yeah. Nevertheless, they are very, very complicated to study. Right? And the reason for this is the following. This Hodge star actually changes over the complex structure moduli space. So if you change the shape of the, of the compact manifold, of the Calabiao manifold, then also your Hodge star will change and uh, the vacuum conditions will differ from place to place in this, uh, in this, comp in this uh, moduli space. Now, what people then said is, well, let's have an alternative picture on the story. Maybe this sheds some, some, some new light on, on what, what, what we are doing. Namely, we could say, well, it's a supersymmetric effective theory so it has n equals one supersymmetry. So you can write it down the four dimensional data, a Kähler potential and a super potential. Yeah? And then the vacuum conditions are just the F term conditions on, uh, imposed on this flux super potential. So if I require the vanishing of these uh, vacuum, con uh, vacuum conditions or this F terms, then uh, I find precisely these self-dual fluxes, which I introduced before. Now we have reformulated things in, uh, in an n equals one language. In fact, uh, there's holomorphicity in the game. As you know, the superpotential is holomorphic, but nevertheless, um, things are still complicated. So what actually happens now is that all the information is in the integrals over this omega. Omega is the a D0 form on the Calabiao default. So it's the three zero form on the Calabiao threefold or four zero form on the fourfold. And if you integrate the, this over a certain uh, basis, then you get some holomorphic functions or holomorphic sections. And in fact, they are very complicated transcendental functions in general, and it's very hard to see properties. So even so things are now looking more holomorphic um, the, you don't have an easy way to see general properties. Okay, so this, this leads us to conclude that well, making general conclusions about the structure of vacua is a really tough task. Yeah? So, so maybe, a first, um, um, maybe a first step is to ask, can we get general conclusions about certain regions of the moduli space. So let's think for a moment about the complex structure moduli space. The complex structure moduli space is in fact a complicated uh, beast. And I mean, that's precisely 
uh, one thing we want to understand what kind of what type of field spaces are allowed in, in string theory or in quantum gravity. And what we find is that it has in fact boundaries and asymptotic regions. So it's not a compact uh, space. And what do I mean by this? Well, let's, let's look at a, 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 a relatively simple example, namely the mirror quintic. The moduli space of the mirror quintic is just a, a two sphere. And in fact, one has to exclude certain special points from this moduli space, namely three special points. And at these special points, the manifold actually wildly uh, degenerates, right? Or sometimes more mildly, but it can also really wildly degenerate. For example, uh, the, in the conifold point, this degeneration is, is not too bad and we understand it rather well. And, but there are also really uh, uh, wild degenerations like the large complex structure point where everything kind of uh, blows up and becomes large. Yeah. So these are the boundaries of the complex structure moduli space, these special points. And then the near boundary regions are the regions near these boundary points. And I wrote them down in this, uh, sh shaded them here in some color. So why, why could we be interested in understanding these regions? Well, in fact, we are, whenever you do a string compactification and want to extract an eff effective theory, you, you, you work in one of these regions or in most of the cases, namely in the large, in the large volume regime in order to uh, retain control over your Kaluza Klein modes and so on. And uh, in fact, by mirror symmetry, at least for Calarial manifolds, the large complex structure regime is related to the large volume regime. So all we will be understanding about asymptotic regimes in the complex structure moduli space can be mapped if applicable by mirror symmetry to large volume regimes. But I, uh, I warn you, or I, I, I point this out that the things which I'm going to say in the following, they are much more general than just looking at the large volume regime. So the, the idea is to really look at all the boundaries. And in fact, the story gets really nasty if, if you go to higher dimensional moduli spaces. So in higher dimensional moduli spaces, the boundaries, they can form a kind of a complicated interconnected net kind of uh, network of, uh, of boundaries. Yeah? And there could be uh, the conifold locus could be a higher dimensional locus which intersects another locus and so on. And I just give you the picture here for a two complex structure moduli example, and you see it's already remarkably complicated. Yeah? But what we want to understand is what happens to the periods or what happens to our effective theory in near any of these boundaries or boundary intersections. <clears throat> so this is the systematic understanding which we want to do, and we want to do that without scanning through explicit examples. And then we want to identify states or flux vacua and so on in this asymptotic region. And in fact, recently, uh, many people have uh, looked at these settings and, and studied, uh, tested uh, swampland conjectures, quantum gravity conjectures, exactly in this sort of settings. I tried to list some reference, but then eventually I gave up. So here is some, uh, some excellent view, re reviews, uh, some overview, uh, some overlap is also uh, within with these uh, set of papers. What I want to tell you in the following is, well, there is a very nice technology which, um, which has been developed over many years and now kind of uh, has, has shown its full power, which is called asymptotic Hodge theory. We already applied this in these early papers, but now we understand kind of what is the full power behind this. And I will give you a few hints of, of this. Thomas, by asymptotic yes. regions, do you mean at infinite distance in moduli space or you also include the finite distance boundaries? I also include finite distance. So for example, the conifold is at finite distance. And, uh, and we can treat the conifold uh, in a similar fashion. Yeah. 
However, there is a distinction between, so in fact, the distinction between infinite and finite distance is not the important one. The uh, important one lies uh, more deeply in the structure and it is, uh, is about um, um, what kind of monodromy this boundary has. And, uh, and we will see in a moment, well, we can discuss this at the end, what is the precise distinction of where we get a lot of information, where we get less information. Okay. So we also include finite distance. Okay, so now, um, so what is asymptotic Hodge theory? Well, this is a complicated uh, part of mathematics and I can um, not discuss all the details, but I want to at least highlight a few things. Well, a Hodge decomposition, I think all of you have seen, that's kind of the decomposition of the middle, or in this case here, the middle cohomology of your manifold into PQ forms, yeah? And for a Calabi-Yau manifold, the D comma zero piece, so for example, Calabi-Yau three fold, three comma zero piece is spanned by this omega, this uh, three comma zero form or D comma zero form. And it's, it's actually uh, one dimensional in a Calabi-Yau manifold and it contains all the essential information in this case. In fact, well, this is rather simple, right? The splitting into P and Q. But now we said we want to change the shape or we want to change the complex structure. So that means that this PQ splitting splits, uh, changes from place to place in your moduli space. And then there are non-trivial differential relation between these forms. Yeah. And they actually can be reformulated as differential equations on this omega and you could try to solve them. But this is in general very complicated and that's kind of where you find also these transcendental solutions the, uh, which, which kind of govern your general behavior. If we, would, if we know precisely how this PQ splitting changes, then we also know how the Hodge star uh, behaves, namely on, on primitive forms, one can show that the Hodge star just acts with an I P minus Q, if I have a PQ form, right? So understanding the PQ splitting is, is implying an understanding for, of, the, um, of the Hodge star or the change of the Hodge star. And in fact, the PQ splitting also de determines the Hodge norm, which is kind of the integral over <laughs> omega by star omega. And of course you have seen this everywhere if you do any uh, compactification. So this is always the objects which we are interested in that they determine the kinetic terms of our fields and so on. Sorry, I'm confused. So now your... what are the lessons which we learned about this complex structure moduli space? Sorry, Thomas, on the previous slide, mm -hmm. confused by, by the action of the Hodge star. If you, if you take the Hodge star over a three comma zero form, you get the zero comma three form probably, right? What, what do you mean by this equation? Uh, no, when you take the Hodge star of a three comma zero form, you get a three comma zero form with an, with a, uh, okay. with a right. minus uh, It's my, my own confusion. Okay, sorry. Okay, so now, um, now I give you some, some results and, and they, they are, at, 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 in parts, they are very deep results and uh, uh, they are exciting to understand, but I hope to give you some highlights of them. So, so from asymptotic Hodge theory. So the first insight is that is on each of these boundaries of the uh, moduli space, let's take a co-dimension N boundary. Yeah? The, this middle cohomology admits a boundary PQ decomposition and the decomposition into SL2 C to the N representations, okay? So this N is the co-dimension of the boundary. So the higher co-dimension the boundary is, the more SL2 factors you find. And the fact that there exists a PQ decomposition should kind of surprise you if one thinks more closely about this, because as I told you, at these boundaries, these, um, these manifolds are wildly degenerate. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of, the thing is completely 
uh, squeezed and squashed and so on, but still you can define some PQ decomposition on this boundary. I, let me give you an example. So for a Calabiao threefold, if you send one parameter to the boundary, you find an SL2C as the kind of classifying group. And the decomposition is just like this on the boundary, on the boundary of the moduli, on the wildly singular uh, manifold. And in fact, each of these PQ spaces can be further decomposed into spins, spin eigenstakes of this SL2. Yeah. And that means that depending on what kind of boundary I find, I find a different PQ decomposition and a different spin uh, SL2 representation, finite dimension SL2 representation. In general, for multiple spins, this is much more complicated, but it still works. And in fact, you can, uh, uh, these SL2s, they actually, they, they commute with each other. You really can associate SL2 labels. It's maybe an interesting fact that it took mathematicians to go from the one dimensional case to the multi-dimensional uh, case, took them about uh, 10, to 10, 10 to 13 years to understand the generalization. So this is from, from this paper to this paper. In any case, uh, if you have this associated to the boundaries, then there is a classific then you can perform a classification of all possible boundaries using SL2 representation theory. And you have to also include positivity of this Hodge, this Hodge norm. And what you then find is actually a very systematic way of going through all possible boundaries. So let me just quickly uh, uh, go through some examples. For one modulus, there are essentially, there, there are four cases, a mild or no degeneration, then a type one, type two, and type four. And they all kind of can be associated to examples which you know from, 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 from geometric Calabiao manifolds. It already gets much more complicated if you have two moduli. In two moduli cases, you can have intersecting boundaries and so on. But again, you can classify all possibilities. Yeah? And there you find something like 20 cases. Yeah? But the important upshot is whatever example you study, it will fall in one of these categories. Yeah? So for example, if you study cyber-quitten theory embedded into string theory, this is in this type of... Uh, boundaries. If you study large complex structure and mirror symmetry, this will be in this sort of boundaries and so on. And you can imagine that this list gets more and more complicated the more moduli you have. And Thomas, the claim is that this uh, class, this list comes about just by studying representations theory of SL2? It comes by representation theory with positivity constraints. Okay. But the, uh, but the uh, of course, the representation theory is limited by the fact that you have a Calabi-Yau manifold with a certain Hodge numbers and so on. Yeah, so the, the dimension of these representations cannot be arbitrary large. They are very restricted in dimension. But, but, but uh, indeed, it's kind of a combination of representation theory and uh, positivity constraints. Okay. So in any asymptotic regime the, of the complex structure moduli space, in fact, we uh, can approximate now the Hodge star using these SL2 spins. In fact, so you can write down an explicit expression for this Hodge norm in a, in, in a, in a certain regime of the moduli space and this, the scaling uh, of the Hodge norm is precisely given by these SL2 spins. And I should mention that I send these coordinates yi to be very large. So this, my boundary is at infinity where all these y's are infinite. Okay, it's, I, I realize that it's not easy to understand this expression in, on, on, on just looking at it once, but I think the important message to get across is that uh, in every asymptotic regime, we now understand how the Hodge uh, norm 
behaves, right? How it scales with the moduli, the leading scaling. Yeah. And this is in fact very non-trivial as I will uh, see, is, explain in the next uh, slide. This is the leading most crude approximation, but it's very easy to handle, right? It's just polynomials. You have to deal with polynomials. And, and you have to keep in mind that we, the, the statement that these were transcendental functions, they have a lot of exponential corrections, it's still true, right? Uh, but the fact that they are always at this leading um, polynomial behavior is, is coming out of asymptotic Hodge theory and it's very non-trivial. So the, the claim is that, so this is an example for, uh, for the mum point, but you can also, for the, uh, for the conifold point, you understand well how to approximate this norm. So this is true for every asymptotic regime. Mm -hmm. Also for the, uh, for the conifold point, for all points in modular space, for all boundaries. It, yeah. It, it could be that the leading polynomial term is a constant in certain directions. That could be, but it's always polynomial. The Hodge star. <clears throat> okay, so then the, uh, it, it, it goes, goes even before, very beyond that, in fact, in every asymptotic regime of the complex structure modular space, we can reconstruct the periods and the Hodge star in the important leading term. So what goes into this story? Well, first of all, of course, the boundary data, namely this SL2s and this PQ decomposition, they are not only classified, but we know they are normal forms. And then there, I mean, as you know, if you have ever studied periods, there are much more coefficients in there. And then there is another piece of information, which are, is in a chain of operators, which we call phase operators. We don't know, uh, we don't know, they are only fixed if you fix them with examples, but we know the constraints on them and we can write down the most general ansatz with these constraints. And, and then what you can do, you can in fact develop some sort of holographic perspective for this. And this is actually very nice in the N equals one case. So in the one dimensional case where you just have an SL2, then you can really re systematically reconstruct the, the bulk Hodge star, so going slightly inside the moduli space by using this boundary data and solving some non-trivial recursion relations. In fact, what we recently now understand is kind of that this is actually very nicely fitting into some aspects of uh, holography for, for vesemino witten models. In any case, the upshot is that uh, you can construct the leading uh, Calabi-Yau threefold periods or also Calabi-Yau fourfold periods if you combine this uh, boundary data. And the, ama the amazing part is that it does not only include polynomial part, uh, polynomial terms, but also essential exponential corrections. In fact, away from the large complex structure point, which was just mentioned, right, in the question, these, is, these exponential corrections are needed. They're always needed because you have to ensure that your moduli space metric and so on, they are non-degenerate and you just simply need them to make sure this, uh, that, that, that not everything degenerates, yeah? And the asymptotic Hodge theory techniques allow you to, to construct which terms are needed Right, which are absolutely necessary to ensure the non-degeneracy of your whole Hodge structure. That's what you mean by essential exponential contributions? So that's what I mean by essential. By essential, I mean that, for example, that, that your, your moduli space metric, all your uh, metrics do not degenerate. Yeah. So if you write down the periods and you compute the metric from them, yeah. the moduli space metric, it shouldn't get become zero and for example, in the conifold, if you would not include the exponential correction, it would be zero in the if you don't include the exponential correction. So the, all the information is in the exponential corrections. But asymptotic Hodge theory still allows you to, to understand what is the essential information in the exponential corrections. So we are not able to reconstruct the whole periods, but we are able to reconstruct the 
essential corrections, which you always have to have in order to uh, understand non-degeneracy. But so is the claim that if you use Picard hooks now to solve the periods, this procedure permits you to find the, the geometric basis of the periods? So you don't have to do analytic continuation anymore. You can just fix. No, no. At... I mean, you, you, you still would have to do analytic continuation to fix the coefficients because you want to understand what the coefficients are at the various boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah? and, and we take these coefficients, so to say, as, un, uh, as free constants and we constrain if they have to be positive or so, but we cannot fix them because we don't look at examples. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can tell you which terms have to be there in order that uh, you, you, your system doesn't collapse, right? That you generate the full uh, PQ decomposition, for example. Mm -hmm. And here are some examples, like for the conifold, you find this, or for this, for this kind of type boundary, you find this forms of the period. Type two boundaries, you find this but it gets arbitrarily complicated if you increase the number of moduli. But these are the essential terms which you have to include in order that this whole system uh, doesn't collapse. Now, um, you can imagine that this is kind of giving us a lot of power. And in particular, we can now uh, uh, introduce a new procedure to find flux vacuum. And that's what I was setting up to do. And in fact, um, you can try to uh, find a new way of solving these self-duality conditions using this asymptotic Hodge theory techniques. And so what is the idea here? Well, you, the idea would be to kind of go in various steps of approximation. So the first approximation is this SL2 approximation where you're really close to the boundary. Then you include these essential exponential corrections, you know you have to include them because otherwise the whole system kind of uh, degenerates. Of course, they, they also include it here, but in, in, in an even more crude way in some sense. This is polynomial. And then here you find already some corrections to these polynomials. And then if you are powerful enough, you can compute the full poly periods and, uh, and study the exact vacuum. Now, it could happen that in, in this SL2 approximation, certain flat directions appear, which are stabilized in successive step. And that's a way also to generate hierarchies between uh, the various moduli. So this is a very nice uh, approach because it's completely algorithmic. It, it, it's, it, it's, up, it's also very abstract. You can do it in principle. Uh, abstractly to, to an arbitrary number of moduli, but then you have a lot of unknown coefficients, yeah? But you know positivity constraints. But if you have example, it gives you also favorable numerics, right? If you, you know, if you have many moduli to find solutions to equations uh, which have exponential terms is very hard, but if you have a good starting point, it could work better. It allows you to naturally implement hierarchies as we recently dis uh, discussed in this, in this paper where we discussed for example, that these essential instantons can be used to construct small w0. And you can have also do things for possibly large number of moduli and fluxes. And for example, recently there was this tadpole conjecture put forward uh, uh, and we, we are now thinking about kind of how one can use these asymptotic techniques to actually provide um, some general evidence that this correct, uh, conjecture is actually true. In any case, uh, these uh, things are just um, one, part of the, uh, one part of the story, but now I want to kind of go back to the original question. I want to ask myself, well, can I actually prove something using these techniques? Is there a way? <laughs> I mean, is there one of the conjectures which is long there? And finally, we have a way to, 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 to generally prove it. And this brings me to this finiteness conjecture. Yeah. So what is the finiteness conjecture? The finiteness conjecture now states that if I have an integral flux and the self, which is self-dual, so I impose this vacuum condition and I have this tadpole condition, then there should be only finitely many solutions to this. 
I should note, I fixed the Calabi-Yau manifold in the following. So I, if you want, I assume that there are only finitely many calabi -Yaus. I'm not able to prove this uh, in, the, in, this, in this talk or as of now in any other way. So what is the, um, what is the, the, what is the question? Well, the question is around for a long time, is the number of solutions here finite? And there has been evidence presented for this and uh, using this kind of density function. And there was a, uh, I'm, I assume many of you have seen this by Douglas and collaborators. That's where these estimates of number of flux vac vacua come from, like the 10 to the 500 and so on. But to be, to, to be fair, these were rather crude uh, approximations to the actual numbers, right? I mean, no one knows how to precisely determine the precise number. And in fact, what I'm saying is not even the finiteness was definitely shown. So why is this a very, very hard mathematical problem? At first you could think, well, this is like a simple thing because I have this bound here on the tadpole, so G4 wedge G4, and then I use the self-duality to write this as a something positive. So this is something positive. And then if I have something positive, I draw a line, some, some kind of circle, which indicates how far out in radius I go dictated by this. And then I just count all the vacua inside and this obviously finite. Yeah. Well, this picture is tempting. And of course it's true if I fix what the Hodge star means. But what I just told you in the first part of the talk is that the Hodge star, the asymptotic uh, behavior of the Hodge star is, is, is polynomial. So it can be also become arbitrarily large or arbitrarily small. And that means that if I, if I move in moduli space, I could move to one of these boundaries and the circle could become larger and larger and more and more vacua could be inside this uh, circle or more and more fluxes. Yeah. And, to con and the finiteness question is to exactly cut off these infinite tails. Yeah. So it's, 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 that's the whole meat of the story. So the, the, the whole bulk of the moduli space is boring for, for this finiteness question because there it's obviously finite. Only near the boundary regions, we have to control the story. And there we have the asymptotic Hodge theory techniques. Now, what, is, what would be the first idea? The first idea would be you control every bar, pass to every boundary and show that there only can be finitely many vacua there. This can be done at co-dimension one. And if you want to learn uh, this SL2 technique, you can see this very beautiful, I think, application uh, in this finiteness proof. And the remarkable thing is you need essentially the whole SL2 technique. Like you need the whole power of the SL2 technique. Yeah. And it's already very, very non-trivial. So you have to use the whole SL2 orbit theorem and so on. Unfortunately, the general story is orders of magnitudes more complicated. Namely, if you have more moduli, you can take passes which kind of make go in circles or turn around, or you, you can make passes which are arbitrarily complicated and it's very, very hard to control every such path. Just to indicate a little bit how complicated this is, somehow the a slightly weaker story would be to ask, if the 2,2 fluxes are uh, finite. And in fact, mathematicians have studied this in much more generality and such 2,2 fluxes would be called Hodge classes. And there is a very famous theory by Katani, Delin, Kaplan, which is often viewed as the strongest evidence for the Hodge conjecture because you can prove parts of the, uh, you can prove parts of this theorem assuming the Hodge conjecture or you can prove it using these SL2 techniques. But what these uh, mathematicians have done is they use the SL2 techniques to control every path to every boundary. However, they used holomorphicity. And if we want to look at this more general fluxes, namely these self-dual fluxes, holomorphicity is not at our disposal. So we need to use uh, some 
some even more like even more powerful results to get this. And what is this more powerful result? Well, it it comes from a recent breakthrough connecting Hodge theory with a, a, a field of mathematics coming from logic, namely tame topology. So what have these mathematicians done here? They have shown that this period map, so before I called it the period integral pi, that this period map has certain very nice properties. So in fact, they show that it is tame. And uh, they use these SL2 techniques, which I introduced before. And what they have given is an alternative proof of the theorem of Catani, Delin, and Kaplan. Now, I understand that this is a, a very rough uh, a list of things. Let me give you an even rougher uh, statement, which maybe is closer uh, understandable to what I was starting with is, they have shown that these arithmetic quotients, these quotients of groups, they have can be covered by finitely many patches and there is some sort of nice finiteness structure uh, in, these, uh, in these quotients. And they have shown that the periods are in fact um, uh, special maps which map finite things to finite things. Sorry, Thomas, okay. to, demystify, to demystify this map here, should we think of G mod K as the Z equal to half plane where, where the period matrix is valued? And gamma, yes. as, gamma as the monodromy group? Yes, that's absolutely correct, yes. This is, this is uh, for the simplest examples, right? And, uh, and the important statement is that these, um, these spaces here, they are in general not algebraic. They ha don't have an algebraic structure. So you cannot use algebraic geometry to study them. You need to go beyond algebraic geometry, but they have some uh, a nice structure, which I'm going to introduce in the last part of the talk. But it's yeah. a map to an embedding, so it's not an isomorphism, right? It's an embedding, and you have a, a surface inside the, the arithmetic cushion. Is that what you mean? Uh, it's not. You mean the image of the period map, or the the image from uh, the uh, the the moduli space itself is not uh, an isomorphism. It's like uh, an embedding of it inside the symmetric space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the short key locus for Riemann surfaces, right? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 okay. Let, we, we can we can discuss this uh, at some point. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, now, so what we want to do here is even more general. So we want to talk about the potential and the vacuum of this potential. Now the question is: Can we use the map? That, uh, the fact that this period map is so nice, so tame, to also show the finiteness of vacuum. So you have to show the finiteness of so zero solutions to this potential. And, and here you should now, uh, here you should now vary, right? And this is the, the very non-trivial, uh, another non-trivial part of the story. So first you have to control the fact that the period map could be completely wild which it is not as these mathematicians have shown. And the second aspect is you could think, well, I have infinitely many fluxes to choose. And so an infinite discrete set, so you could imagine that uh, um, you, you suddenly actually get some kind of, kind of infinitely many images uh, or infinitely many zeros. And in fact, what, one, what we show is that, um, that the, the, that this finiteness, this tameness is preserved if you impose this tetra bound. So indeed what one finds then is that uh, one only finds finitely many pairs of flux choices and vacua, but it could be that if you choose a flux that they are flat directions, that's totally fine, but there are just finitely many such choices. Yeah? Or if you switch on no flux, then this, the whole moduli space is a flat direction but it's just one, right? It's just one connected set. The answer is then it's just finitely many. So now <laughs> the, exciting, the exciting part of this is now, what is this tame topology? What is this kind of structure which one is using here? 
And in fact, it comes um, from, it, it is built on some sort of, uh, some dream, some, uh, uh, some program which was outlined by Grotentik uh, quite some time ago in the 80s, uh, beginning of the 80s. And it was his idea to develop some sort of topology which is more useful for geometers, which kind of gets rid of uh, some pathologies which you which you find in ordinary topology. Yeah, and uh, you can read this uh, better, better than me. In fact, uh, you can also read the original publication of Grotendieck where he kind of outlines this general idea. And what has become clear in the 90s is, I would say around in the 90s that the, the, the theory of all minimal structures uh, gives such a tame topology, realizes this quote and extreme of, of finding uh, this such a tame uh, topology. Yeah. And it actually provides a generalization of algebraic geometry. And I mentioned already, that's exactly what you need in order to, uh, to study these arithmetic quotients. Yeah. And what does this uh, mean? Well, uh, it applied to the potential. Think about again about this potential here. If we want to have a, a tadpole, if we import a tadpole, we want to have that the, the solutions to we have special properties. So the potential itself has to be special. And in fact, many functions do not work, right? You can immediately come up with a function like sine phi minus one, which has infinitely many zeros, yeah? In an arbitrarily small region of moduli space. And if you would have such a function in this such a potential, you have infinitely many vacua and, and, and finiteness is lost. And in fact, what we show is that this never happens. And this geometry is precisely designed in such a way that it kicks out such functions. It forbids such functions, yeah? And the own minimal structure therefore give the precise answer, what is the special property of the flux scalar for uh, potential? <clears throat> now in the last uh, uh, five minutes, I want to give you a, a rough feeling what, what, this, uh, what, what this geometry is about. Well, the, the easiest way to, the easiest way to implement uh, finiteness is to first look at the real line, right? There we have a kind of intuitive, no, intuitive notion of what we mean by finite. Well, something is finite if we just pick finitely many points. So an infinite lattice, I would not call, uh, or infinitely uh, spaced lattice, I would not call a finite set of points, but that would be clearly infinite. But any finite set of points is fine. Any finite number of intervals is also fine. A any finite number of open intervals, or they could even stretch to infinity, is also fine. The, the whole real line is also a fi finite set. And what we want to do is kind of to connect, uh, to kind of collect all these sets. Now, the, the, the it needs a little bit of thought, but if you can think about how to extend this to Rn, and you will see that this is much, much more difficult to, to come up with a, a, a consistent notion of finiteness in a higher dimensional space, yeah. So it's much harder to extend this to Rn. And uh, you can maybe come up with easy intuitive ideas what to, what to implement. For example, you could say, well, I, if I, at least if I project down to R, I should get only back to finitely many sets. Okay, that, that might be something useful to have. I allow for finite unions and finite intersections and finite products, uh, but I should not allow for infinitely many uh, products or infinitely many intersections and so on. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I, I thought your definition for R is just to have, uh, to have finitely many connected components, uh, 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 and you don't want to have simply that for higher dimensional. So, what is the problem? I no, 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 no. This, uh, uh, this would uh, this would not be um, this would not be sufficient. You want to avoid accumulation points, I suppose, right? Some kind of Hausdorff uh, property. Yeah. So the so the, stru the structure is 
So the precise notion of what one go is going to introduce is, is given on this slide. I didn't want to explain it in too much of detail. So it's, it's not just by collecting uh, some, it's not just by collecting sets, but you would want to also make sure that these sets are consistent under some logical operations. Like you can, you can specify them by equations. For example, you can give them as polynomial equations or you can give them as uh, equations where you write x squared plus y squared is bigger than something like uh, inequalities, yeah? And then you want to make these sets to be consistent under certain operations like projections and so on. And if you take all of this into account, you end up with what one calls a structure. Yeah? And if you include the fact that everything should project down to on the real line to finite unions of intervals of, of intervals and points, then you end up with what I showed you in the first uh, picture, right? So this is the one dimensional case and then an O minimal structure actually is the higher dimension generalization where you have all these operations allowed. And in fact, these structures come from logic and in logic, you want to have all these operations included in the structure. Okay, so I, I realize that this is a, this is quite a quite a burden to understand in such a short time. But I think the important thing I underlined here uh, is that finiteness is built in into the structure in a very very non trivial way. And in fact, once you have this structure, you can also def you can define what you mean by a function which is compatible or which is tame. And these are called definable functions. And in fact, definable functions are uh, the graphs of, uh, the, the, their graphs is in these O minimal structures. Yeah. So, so, so it's kind of, you change the notion of what you call the, the viable sets, and then you, you introduce a notion of what are the allowed functions. And of course you uh, see where I'm going at that the period map is, exactly one of these allowed functions in, uh, in this structure. And I wanted to highlight that these functions have very special properties and you can prove theorems, but maybe I cut this short, namely uh, uh, these functions, they can be always split into finitely many, uh, so you can split the interval, the, the region where the function is defined into finitely many intervals and on each interval it's monotonic and uh, continuous. So these are very special function and, and the period map is one of these special functions. If you combine it with holomorphicity, you get even more strong constraint. Thomas, it would be uh, time yes. to wrap up. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be time to wrap up. But, uh... Yes, exactly. I, I'm almost uh, on my last slide. Uh, this is my uh, second to last slide. So now uh, there is no unique structure, but there are many examples of such structures. And the most exciting example is where you uh, include certain special functions to generate your own minimal structure, namely including the exponential function. And now comes the result, uh, this recent uh, important result is that the period map is one of these de definable functions and therefore it kind of has automatically finiteness properties uh, built in. So this brings me to the last slide of my talk uh, before the conclusion. Well, I mean, if there is such an amazingly general structure, which also is, has many intuitive uh, ways of thinking about uh, scalar potential and functions appearing in the landscape, maybe let's, uh, let's use this as a principle to, de to, to study all the couplings in an effective theory. So now combine the moduli space, the rank of gauge group, the, uh, the matter spectrum into some, some uh, vector or some set. And then I would uh, say that uh, an exciting conjecture to study is to say that maybe the string theory la landscape is definable precisely in such an O minimal structure. And all the coupling functions in the effective theories are definable. And what I have shown you uh, or what, what, what we have 
proved in this or paper which will appear in the near future is that this is at least true for the flux landscape of type 2b. So this brings me to the end. I wanted to uncover some general structure of the complex structure moduli space using asymptotic Hodge theory. Uh, no need to go through examples. And then we are ready to make general proofs of reasoned conjectures like this finiteness conjecture. And in this finiteness conjecture, we have learned that uh, these SL2 techniques, these asymptotic Hodge theory techniques have now been lifted away from the Hodge theory world to kind of the real world. <laughs> With real, I mean uh, over the real functions using this um, uh, all minimal structures. And I suggested to study the string theory landscape using these structures uh, in the following years. Thank you for your listening. Thanks a lot for the very inspiring talk. We have time for questions. Maybe we can start with questions from ESP and then we go to online. There are any. Maybe I just ask one question. You, you, in order to get some more feeling for, for this SL2C action, can, can you briefly explain the relation uh, with the uh, with the monodromy? How, how you can uh, see this information from the monodromy around the singularities? Right. Yeah, so, 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 so one of the main theorems about monodromy, the kind of the monodromy theorem is that the monodromy is always a unipotent, uh, a quasi unipotent. So what does that mean? It satisfies a certain simple, simple looking equation that if you, well, I, I don't have it on a slide. So it satisfies some equation. And, and in practice, this means it can be always decomposed as a product of some unipotent part and the uh, and um, a semi-simple part. So now, if you have not, have not heard about unipotent uh, matrices, then the uh, better way of thinking about the unipotent part is to think about uh, the fact that it it can be then described by a nilpotent matrix, yeah, N. A nilpotent matrix. Huh? The Jordan decomposition of the of the monodromy matrix, in other words. Yes, yes. So exactly. So there is a nilpotent. There is part of the monodromy is determined by the nilpotent a, a nilpotent matrix. Namely, it's precisely this part of the monodromy where, uh, which is not finite. So where you go around infinite, like you can just add up multi, more and more times, like, um, um, and then. Um, this nilpotent matrix, you know that any nilpotent matrix can always be completed into a representation of SL2. And therefore, each monodromy, which has a unipotent piece, defines uh, you in SL2. The SL2 is not unique, but it becomes unique if you cup or it becomes quasi unique if you couple it with the, with the other parts of the uh, HP uh, Hodge structure decomposition. And okay. that's where the SL2 comes from. So it's really a part of the monodromy which induces this SL2. And then I told you the there's as another boundary data, data the PQ de decomposition. And you can think of the PQ decomposition as being the positivity condition you know, of containing the positivity information in the limit. And so the punchline is the symmetry in the limit and the positivity in the limit determine much of the structure in the limit. Thanks. Any other questions? Both online and in the room. Can we see what's going on online, actually? Yeah, it, well, if people should oh, unmute themselves, should, uh, they, they, they want to ask yes. a question, obviously. Yes.
Okay. I actually had a question about, uh, um, I, sorry, I, I have a question about the um, this limit of the moduli space. So there are some geometries which one can build in the in the context of microstate geometries, which have many Gibbon socking centers, which give you some two cycles. And, you know, so you can think about some uh, M-theory compactification on a T4 times, uh, times, um, um, times some K3. And, you know, then you can describe the K3 space as a bunch of Gibbon socking centers and a bunch of uh, Atia Hitchin centers, like, like the Orientifolds. So there are some solutions which are explicitly constructed for this kind of uh, for this kind of compactifications, and uh, I'm just wondering if you know in this example what is the large complex structure limit of those solutions corresponding to, and you know if you have an idea of how of how this of how this uh, I mean whether this uh, calculation of yours can be can be extended to this uh, to these things. Uh, so for example in the K3 in the in the Gibbon stocking limit, you know, do you know how the large complex structure limit looks like, and I mean do, do the Gibbon stocking centers for example collapse or they collapse okay. on top of that. Yeah, Hitchin centers, or I'm I'm just wondering if you if you have. Yeah, yeah. So so of yeah for for K three the story is even more well developed. Yeah. So 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 I don't. It doesn't sound like as if this would be a large complex structure limit which you are describing. So what what indeed what one of these limits which which happens is kind of where your manifold like some sort of stable degeneration limit where your manifold splits up into various pieces, which, which, which has um, geometrically, which has kind of like um, connecting tubes, which become long, longer and longer, right? Hmm. And, 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 and these are, this is part of this class, this is part of this classification. So some of these limits correspond, correspond precisely to these kind of, uh, stretching limits and so on. And the, and the trick is now to, to define, so, so the idea is, the fo is somehow the following, yeah? you define, you, you, you pull the spaces apart and then you can define a homology space, a kind of a homology on this. And then you can ask the question, how is this related to the, the smooth K3 homology? And there must be some sort of limiting procedure which connects the two. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's that's kind of the geometric part of this um, uh, of this Hodge theory story, which is also there's a whole branch of of this which is uh, which is really looking at pre the precise geometry. Yeah, mm -hmm. and for K three, this is done to quite some extent. Okay. Thanks. But but I can I mean I can but send the you the talking, paper, but, but, but I think the, the, the Gibbon socking limit of K three if I can think the limit when I can think about the K three as a bunch of Gibbon socking centers with some bubbles between and so on that limit is not in this. Uh... No, I, I could imagine that it's in among these, right? So it's uh, I mean it could be that some part of this limit is actually in the other, in, in some part of the information about this limit is in the other part of the monotony in the semi simple piece in the finite piece. But I think this limit which you're describing uh, sounds as if this would be something which is, uh, uh, which is, which is one of these type two type limits. Yeah. But okay, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I didn't look into this. I, so, so what we are doing is uh, we are looking at the story more from the abstract point of view without, so there are two parts of, Hodge, of this Hodge theory. One is the geometric part. And one is this uh, more abstract way. And I was so far mostly applying the more abstract approach. But there is a geometric approach which really tells you what exactly shrinks in which limit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Uh, we need to take a break before the next talk. So unless there are other urgent questions, uh, let's thank uh, Thomas again for a great talk. Thank you.